Hello, Rick here with another Cultural Index. Now this time, despite the votes going in favour of the Mirror Universe's Terran Empire, I thought the Helgast deserved some recognition. So, let's look into... Wait, what? <sighs> What's that, that? What? Hello. You, how? But now hold But still. I'm... Hey, no, no, no! no. <laughs> Oh, God. oh, bloody hell. He blathers on, doesn't he? Hello. I'm Rick, and today I'm going to educate you on the glory of the Terran Empire. Maybe you'll learn a thing or two about how to run an interstellar power properly. Although, admittedly, the Empire itself is currently on hiatus, let's say, I have no doubt that we will rise again. A fundamental fact of power, you need respect to keep order, and to get respect you instill discipline through fear. Time and time again throughout our history, it's shown that progress and development can be accelerated through the subjugation and the domination of other races, incorporating their wealth and power into your own. Oh yes, the pursuit of money credits is still very much a motivational factor in the Empire. And it works out well. The Empire itself has stood for over 340 years. Most of our history is a tribute to war. New weapons, new tactics, new means of survival, all leading to a stronger Empire. Because of this, when the Vulcans landed on Earth to assess us for invasion, we struck first. They'd come over to see our technology after we invented warp travel, and in response, we took theirs, reverse engineered it, and were at their doorstep before they knew what hit them. Of course, the Vulcans say that they came in peace on that day, but our history has been one of conflict and victory, so why would another species so similar to our own have a history that was any different? They were here to conquer us when we beat them to it. This set the precedent. Expand, encounter, overpower, subjugate, learn and repeat. The Vulcan Science Directorate, for example, was allowed to continue to exist, but under the management of Starfleet, as was the Andorian Imperial Guard. Later on, especially under the rule of the Sato dynasty, some species were even made equal to the Terrans, or at least granted positions of power in an effort to placate any ideas of rebellion. Life in the Empire was difficult, but if you couldn't cope, you didn't deserve to survive. Although technically, mutiny was still a crime, it was more of a subjective point of view. Depending on the amount of support the mutineer had and the opinion of the crew, a mutiny was often considered a viable form of career advancement, even if it meant killing the former captain. So, always keep an eye open to advance your position. No one would hold it against you if you severed loyalties to advance, it was just business as usual. But of course, keep in mind, everyone is playing the long game. Just as you stole a promotion by incriminating a superior, you yourself could be disposed of, opening up new avenues of opportunity for other people. This leads to quite a paranoid view of, well, everything. And often people seek respite in the arms of consorts, the confides of a companion, or simply a quiet space to return to. It wasn't uncommon for people of power to surround themselves with armed guards and confidants whose loyalty could be ensured with promises of power and wealth, and if that didn't work, there was always the option of torture. The pain booth, for example, was quite an experience, as were the personal agonisers often found on each crewman. So, as you can see, there are differences between the alternate universes. Let's look at the uniforms of the Empire. Similar to the Starfleet uniforms of this reality, differences included the display of achievements on the chest. This form of boasting was often used to dissuade potential assailants, and perhaps those same capable people could perhaps use some support as they climbed the ranks. Knives were an addition to the uniform and had been for centuries. More than just a tradition, the close quarters armament was a last resort to defend yourself against unexpected attack. And of course, the female variation of the uniform was a weapon of itself. Its obvious design elements were to amplify a female's assets. Why? Well, 
any advantage should be used, and if you find yourself distracted, more for you. Our artwork and literature was in many ways similar to your own. Shakespeare, for example, is almost identical. However, many stories feature a lack of compassion in favour of the more Terran virtues of vengeance and conquest. A lot of artwork, however, like our technology, was appropriated from other cultures. If we liked the look of something, we took it. Simple. Of course, when you can pick and choose from the cream of the crop, often people lose the creativity to generate ideas for themselves. This leads to the most common form of artwork to be merely displays of weapons and artefacts of war slash conquest. Propaganda was circulated frequently in the Empire in order to hide any signs of weakness, but the truth was, the Empire was spreading itself thin. Intervention from the alternate universe, your Federation universe, further complicated things. Certain peaceful ideals and moral virtues that for a long time had bubbled away as dissident ideas and rebellion began to crop up in the ranks of the Empire. So some say Spock's period of reform was inevitable in order to strengthen the Empire. They say that our way of life would only have lasted another 240 years and that aggressive expansion was unsustainable. His ideals to compromise and extend diplomatic ties were to create an empire that could last, and who knows, it may have worked if the Kittimer talks hadn't broken down. You see, many people say the empire adopted such a ruthless attitude because it was surrounded by equally ruthless adversaries. Others say that if the empire hadn't been so aggressive in its early history, then other races would have been far more lenient on us, it doesn't matter. That may be how it works in your Starfleet, but in mine, peace brought us to our knees. The Terran Empire is gone, and humans are slaves to the Alliance. Our worst enemies and our former subjects allied together to overthrow us. <laughs> well, at least they're working together. Our artwork, history, weapons and technological development were all confiscated and reutilised as the spoils of war for the Alliance. Our culture destroyed and instead replaced by the drab, the plain and the mundane. Shades of greys and browns for clothing, flavourless gruel for food, a sheet on the floor for sleep. Many Terrans now seem resigned to their fate, hauling dilithium in mines, working in Alliance-controlled refineries. All are treated with this disdain and little compassion. <laughs> Perhaps we've earned it. Those Terrans that perform well, those who please the Alliance superiors, are provided with some privileges. A ranking system among the populace of most facilities where the more critical assignments were allocated to the more deserving and hard-working. And some people were even allowed limited freedoms to operate independently. These people often adopt an apathetic attitude towards other Terrans. After all, they've worked hard to receive those privileges. Why turn away from the opportunities provided in order to help some strangers? Most understand this, even if they disagree. After all, everyone is out for themselves. But ironically, it took intervention from the other reality again to show us a way out. By working together to overthrow the Alliance, engaging in open hostility with them, liberating Terrans across the systems, an effective resistance force was organised. We will overthrow them and return as the dominant force in the galaxy. We have two options now. Restore the Terran Empire in its former glory, instill an Emperor to rule over Starfleet and its divisions, or create a more diplomatic approach, a galactic commonwealth, and hope for a more forgiving reception. Either way, the Terran Empire was founded on the ideals of conquest and order, but in spreading its dominance across the galaxy it opened itself up to the cultures of other races and influences from different points of view. This changed it, and we strove to make a more fair galaxy in an unfair universe. But maybe, just maybe, those ideals have a place. We've seen that it can work. Either way, my time here is limited and I have something else to attend to. Okay, so, what's these 
notes then. Uh, the next video can be on the San Xiong prophets of the Halo universe. <laughs> Look at their headdresses. Uh, or the prawns. Sorry, the Polypqua from District 9. District 9? What? Where's District 9? Anyway, I've been Rick with a K. Thanks for watching, and be sure to pick which video comes up next or stuff. Whatever. I'm out.